All right, today we're going to talk about developmental psychology, chapter three. And I always kind of, you know, consider this chapter and the kind of the sequence that we're going is that when you really start, we really start talking about psychology. The previous chapters kind of talk about the scientific as well as the biological ones. But this starts looking at simply applying psychology to, you know, everyday situations. And so developmental psychology with introduction goes from simply, you know, conception until death. That's what this chapter is going to look at. Now, like I just said, developmental psychologists look at the changes that occur over a person's lifespan. Now, what this brings into play a lot of times is the, you know, pretty much one of the oldest arguments, and that's nature versus nurture. Now, nature, I mean, first things first, you have to know what the difference is between the two. Nature is genetics, okay? Nurture is environment. Now, what I kind of like to do with separating this, nature, if you use it like in everyday language, is someone's natural. Natural means what they're born with, ability. So some people have a natural ability to remember things, have a natural ability to run fast, right? They've been given that as a genetic gift. Now, nurture is the other side of the argument. If I had to kind of stick with what I just said with the two examples, some people, okay, who do, do not have the natural ability to remember things, have to work harder in their environment, okay? In other words, study more in order to understand it. I mean, both of these aim at the goal, learning material. Some people it comes natural to, it's rather easy, they don't have to work at it. Other people have to work, you know, especially hard, all right? So they, in other words, nurture is your environment. Now, a couple of people that, you know, supported different viewpoints here. John Locke believed humans are born with a blank slate, tabula rasa. And that's what a blank slate means. And that environment impacts our development. A good way to look at Locke's theory is to simply say we are like a book when we're born with a bunch of blank pages. And then over our life, we write words and experiences on these pages. So at the end of our life, we have a fully written book. Okay. Now, Jean Rousseau believed that development occurs naturally. Okay. That simply, it's simply when we're born, we're going to you know, develop naturally a certain way. And he actually believed so strongly in this that any type of influence, especially parental influence from the environment, could affect that natural development. So we believe we're born with a plan, with a destination, with a route that we already is predetermined. Okay, so again, you know, Locke would be on the nurture side of the argument. Russell is on the nature side of the argument. Now, Arnold Gassell was one of the first, you know, to investigate or you know investigate development, and he found this key word here: maturation is that the growth of an organism occurs on its own. Okay, our body matures at a certain speed and in a certain way. Okay, and it's predetermined timetable without any influence from the environment. So in other words, in terms of maturation, a couple good examples. In other words, I always look at this, the body maturing. The body matures, the body is going to mature at a set speed that's different for all of us. And you obviously see this in the classroom. Some people look older, some people look younger. Okay. But what is predetermined is simply our aging process. Everyone was different, okay, when they were able to walk or when they were able to crawl. It depended on the maturity of the body, okay. So for some of us, where you know maturation process was rather quickly, you know, not only are we going to crawl sooner, or walk sooner than other people, we're also going to look probably older than most people. Now, Watson, you know, the last person on this, believed that development was solely influenced by the environment. All right, he supported. The nurture side. If you remember from chapter 14, Watson's big thing with behaviorism is that it has to be, you know, based on observable science or overt behavior. Okay, so nurture obviously to him, how we play on the experiences that occur us occur to us every day is a big factor. Now, common question here: maturation refers to environmental influences that potentially put the baby at risk. Development that occurs naturally and without the influence of the environment. Development that occurs because of the influence of the environment. The adaptation of new objects in the already existing schema. Or the implementation of a new schema. Now, maturation, again, remember body matures. Okay? Body matures at its own pace. So, in other words, to tie this question in, it's natural. Maturation is a natural process. So, the environment would be maturation. Okay? Now, dimensions of early physical development, kind of going back to, you know, simply, you know, the conception process. Human development begins as a zygote, all right? It's a new cell created by fertilization of the ovum by the sperm. Now, prenatal development occurs in three distinct stages. The germinal stage, or the zygotic stage, is the cell simply rapidly divides. And this is obviously moments after conception. 
The embryonic stage, which follows this, is when basic life support systems like heart, lungs, nervous systems are formed. Embryonic stage is very important, okay, and it is probably the greatest, you know, threat from teratogens, which we'll talk about in a second, to affect this stage. If something goes wrong in the embryonic stage, you know, the simply the support systems, the heart, the lungs, if they don't develop properly, that can very well impact the rest of the development. The fetal stage is the last seven months, and this is, you know, considered the longest stage. This is when everything starts to become more molded, and it's pretty much what most people see pictures of. Now, Prenatal risk, like I said, the placenta, which is a word you know, often taught in development, is a protective nutrient-filled organ that allows the fetus to develop by filtering out harmful agents. This is kind of like a pool filter. Okay, It only allows certain things to enter into the swimming pool. Now, teratogens are harmful agents that could pass through the placenta. All right? And teratogens, you know, obviously that sounds like a very negative word. Now, some of the most common teratogens, alcohol, smoking, and cocaine, all of which can pass the placenta. In fact, alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome is one of the leading causes of mental challenges among youth. And this is, like I just said, when I say a leading cause, but obviously alcohol is one of the most consumed drugs. And even, and this is kind of the debate, even a slight amount of alcohol can have serious effects. Okay, so this isn't you know, necessarily just reserved to somebody who drinks every day. Now, the term used to define any agent that may interfere with the development in human fetus. Okay, what's a harmful agent, in other words? Is it maturation, teratogen, egocentrism, critical period, or personal fable? And most of you probably just remember, and again, just to reinforce it, teratogen is a very harmful substance that could pass the placenta. Alcohol, cocaine, nicotine are all examples. Now, babies are born with reflexes. Reflexes, again, this supports kind of the, uh, the nature side of the argument. These are our natural tendencies. Now, they're equipped at survival. We're given these reflexes, these several reflexes, to ensure that we are able to survive, especially for a newborn, which is very helpless in the environment. So in other words, you come equipped with these. Now, some of the most common, okay, grasping, object in the palm causes the baby to grasp onto it. Obviously, you know, a lot of times you see a baby holding on, you know, to someone's shirt, okay? That's a natural reflex. Rooting, touching the cheek, which is probably the most important, causes the baby to turn the head in anticipation of food. So often there's a stroke on the baby's cheek, and the baby will turn the head, and then there's the natural tendency to think they're receiving food. Sucking, obviously, you give them you know, a pacifier, you give them a bottle, that automatically will start them you know, to start sucking. Babinski stroke the bottom of a foot, caused the toes to curl, curl up. Okay? Moral reflex would startle or drop the baby arms, will foil back and across. This is like a grabbing motion. So if a baby gets the tendency that they're going to fall, if dad's going to be a smart out and put baby like this, baby's arms are going to go back and forth like that in terms of, obviously, to grab onto something or hold onto something. And then the stepping reflex, baby will step when held upright. All right? And that often disappears when they're able to walk. But you got to watch when you hold a baby. Hold a baby up, a lot of times they're going to give you a kick, right? You know, sometimes in the stomach. Now, Question five that deals with reflexes. Lightly touching infant's cheek will result in the movement of the infant's mouth to whichever side of the face it was touched. Now, is that the Babinski, the moral, the palmer, the sucking, or the rooting? Okay, and most of you, I think, can remember just from the previous slide, that is the rooting reflex. And often you get questions on this reflex because rooting obviously doesn't self-define it. Sucking reflex, I think, self-defines it and so on. Now, Temperament, again, supports the nature side of the argument. And just for review, remember, nature is our natural tendencies. It's what we're born with. But Thomas and Chess were two people that researched the effects of what we call temperament. And this is a natural tendency to express emotions and needs in a particular way. This is simply what leads more than likely to personality or ways of acting, thinking, and feeling. This is what sets the tone. And there's three distinct temperaments, okay? All right, and this comes down to easy which this, the easy child is generally, you know, very happy, routine you know, tends to be cheerful and mood. Difficult, they have a hard time, you know, in terms of getting used to something. They do not have set, you know, sleeping or eating habits. They're often what it means by difficult. They have a difficult, difficult routine or they're somewhat difficult to kind of attach to. And then slow to warm up, you know, usually provides the shock. This is the person that if we watch the slow to warm up child grow up, this is the child that has a tendency to play by themselves, away from the group, has a tendency to study by themselves. Their whole life is going to be characterized by being more or less to themselves. They're slow to warm up. Now, 
over time, nurture will eventually, or I mean temperament will eventually start to fade and eventually personality will start to flourish. Now, <coughs> developmental theories of John Piaget. Piaget was fundamental with cognitive development. The cognitive development is simply how babies and toddlers and infants and adolescents, they start to develop different thinking strategies. Now, there's a couple key introduction words that anytime we talk about Piaget, you have to be able to associate this terminology before you understand the stage theory. But a schema is a mental representation or a map of the environment, all right, or world based on active experiments which are affected through. Schemas are automatic patterns of thought, all right. If I said car, you have a schema that basically describes the car, but what also the car, the purpose of it, how to start a car, how to drive in a car. It's just, an, it's like a big file, it's probably the best way to look at it, that simply it's done enough times that eventually it becomes habit or routine, okay? Bottom line is, it kind of comes down to where thinking isn't required, all right? Most people do not have to think when they turn the key to the ignition. They put the car in the drive and they start going, all right? It's not a thought out process anymore. Why did that occur? You just, you simply drove so many times that it's become habit. Habit and schema are very good words that describe each other. Now. Our schemas, like files, I mean, if you think about a file, a file grows in size over time, okay? There's two ways that schemas start to, you know, expand or develop, all right? Assimilation is simply blending new information to an existing schema. Kind of think of it this way, you're just adding more and more files, okay? Now, here's the thing. Let's say that folder is, you know, phone bills. Well, you're adding, you know, month-to-month -month phone bills, so it's the same type of information, it just grows in size, okay? And that's assimilation. Now, accommodation is simply modification of an existing schema with new information. In other words, you change what's going into that file, all right? So if you rewrote the, uh, the file to include phone and internet, you've modified what's going into that file. So now new information, in addition, you know, let's say internet information is also going into your phone, you know, original phone record. Now, I'll kind of go and give you a couple other examples because these are key to understand. The SS and assimilation, how do you kind of remember this? The same schema. It's the same information, all right? It's not changing the schema. It just keeps on building on knowledge. The C for accommodation stands for change. The information is going to change what that schema was, okay? So, for example, two common examples of assimilation, all right? Let's say um, you're starting to play golf, okay? Well, let's go with a better example than this because not everybody plays golf. But let's say you're simply, you've learned, you know, about one particular type of car, okay? You know, you only knew Chrysler cars because that's where your mom or dad worked. But then you soon learn that GM and Ford also produce cars. So in other words, you've added to your definition of car makers. You've just built it. it. You know, GM has not changed it. They produce cars. So it's added to your overall definition of car producers. Now, let's say accommodation. Okay, this is a classic example I've seen a lot of times on tests. Let's say that, you know, a little Susie growing up thinks that a bird, all birds have to fly. All right, and then down the road, she finds out that penguins are still a bird, but they don't fly. So now she's had to change her definition of what a bird is. A bird can either fly or not fly. All right, so a penguin changed, in other words, C for change, changed her definition. Now. Piaget's stage theory is probably what he's most well known for. Okay, he says that <coughs> at certain ages, certain cognitive, cognitive means thinking, are things are occurring. Now, sensory motor stage from birth to two is marked by one particular main event, and that's object permanence. And the definition is object permanence, which again is around seven months, seven to eight months, is a searching for a behavior. Okay, a searching behavior, searching for an object that's no longer there. Now, a classic example is little Susie drops her water bottle, or her little baby bottle, off of her, off the table and looks down underneath the table for where it is. Okay? Now, most people think, well, isn't that you know, what all kids do? No. Prior to object permanence, they have this out of sight, out of mind. If they don't see it, it no longer exists. This is why they like peekaboo. They find that very entertaining. Every time mom or dad disappears from their sight, they don't know where mom or dad went. And they're not going to search for mom and dad. It's just simply whatever is in front of them is the only thing that they're thinking about. If it's not in front of them, it's gone from their brain. They don't process it anymore. That's why a lot of times little kids get you know upset when you turn off the TV. They don't understand what just happened. All right, they can't understand that. So if they don't see it, they don't know what happened to it. Now, pre-operational is roughly ages three to seven. 
Now, there's several things that are occurring during this stage. Pre-operational means pre-thought, all right? That's what it means. Really, before thought takes off, they go through this stage, okay? And so this is kind of like an introduction to thinking stage. Good way to remember, by the way. But egocentrism is characterized in the pre-operational stage. And what that is, egocentrism, is simply they have an inability to take in other people's point of view. They may stand in front of a TV and not realize they're blocking someone else's view. They may talk on the phone and hold their hand up, all right, or pull a picture up and ask grandpa to look at their picture even though they don't understand that grandpa can't see it. They don't understand people's point of views, all right, and obviously, you know, all their, I mean, it's marked by that kind of mind work. Now, animism is their other little thing that's going on during the pre-operational stage, which if you have a little brother or sister in this bracket, you can identify these. Animism is they believe that inanimate, you know, not real objects share human beings, human feelings, like their teddy bear. All right? That's why if you go and grab their teddy bear, teddy bear and threaten to you know, pull its arm off, which isn't nice to do, by the way, you know, they, uh, they start crying. They will say, Teddy, you know, which I don't want to get confused with the movie that just came out. But you know, they simply you know, believe that that is coming alive. So animism, all right, the movie Ted would disagree with animism. Okay? It wouldn't help little kids. Artificialism is the belief that events in nature are man-made, all right? You grow up with hearing, you know, like, for example, thunder, someone's bowling, all right? You believe that thunder is the result of a man-made event, not a natural event, okay? They don't understand, obviously, the weather systems yet. So they believe in things like, you know, lightning bolts is like when a strike occurs in bowling. Now, the main thing that's occurring during the pre-operational stage, in addition to these, by the way, is symbolic thought. They are living their lives through symbols, all right? A box, okay? Kids love, pre-operational kids love getting a box, all right? Or a fridge box that gets thrown out because that box is a symbol for a fort now. A lot of kids build things in their rooms. And they basically, those little things, like putting pillows up, is a symbol for, you know, some other type of thought. Like a fort or simply, you know, you know a barricade or whatever. But, you know, a lot of times they have, you know, like wrapping paper, they'll grab the cardboard and use it as a sword, okay? Now, a couple questions that come up, and these are important questions. Vinny is five months old and enjoys playing peekaboo. Mainly, as Vinny understands, the human face is there, then it disappears, then it reappears. According to Piaget, what stage is Vinny, Vinny currently in? Now, this is what we're talking about object permanence here. Out of sight is out of mind. Now, when does object permanence occur? Okay, is it pre-operational? Is it concrete operational? Sensory motor? Okay, formal operational. Now, if you put the right answer down, okay, then you probably should have picked sensory motor. So a good way to remember this is take the S in sensory, the O in object permanence, put it kind of together. So you're starting to look for things now. That's a good way to remember it. Okay, and by the way, I just thought about that. Now, another question from, you know, that previous slide. When asked why the sky is blue, Erin responds, because blue is my favorite color. Mine is a key word in there, all right? Does she, she doesn't see anybody else's point of view or any other reasons besides her own. Everything is tied to her. So what term, okay, is she displaying? Now, this will give you a little bit of hint. Occurs in the pre-operational stage. Is that animism, egocentrism, artificialism, personal fable, or industry versus inferiority? Now, here's the thing, if you want to remember this in the future, ego means I, okay, so if you put letter B down, you're, you're right, okay. Now, the other two stages, okay, which the next one, concrete operational occurs from 7 to 11, this is when they start getting some thought press, thought problems, all right, remember pre-operational is pre-thought. Now, the big thing that's happening in the concrete operational stage, you know, and usually kind of the beginning of it is the ability to understand conservations. And conservations is simply, despite changes in shape, the amount within this, you know, the amount within stays the same. Now, most people remember the scientific realm of this. You know, you take 20 milliliters, put it in a short fat beaker, and then you put 20 milliliters in a tall beaker. You were supposed to say which one has more. Well, the answer is they both have the same. But the taller the object is, the more, you know, it gives the appearance there's more in it. Red Bull cans are obviously a great example of this. That's a tall, skinny can gives the, you know, the consumer the idea they're getting more liquid, which, in fact, they're really not. Now, a couple other things that happen in this stage and that really do help the 
process or the law of conservation is to occur. Seriation is the process of putting objects into a series or items into a category. I don't know if you remember this age between 7 and 11, but there was a lot of times, you know, stress or, you know, or pressure to do things in an organized way. You had to hang up your coat here, you had to put your lunch here. You had to constantly put things in order, whether it was shapes, whether it was numbers, because that helps the brain to develop, sort of, so to speak, sequence thinking. Reversibility is understanding that concepts can be reversed. You probably have done this many times in elementary math. You had to go 8 plus 4 is 12, then you had to reverse it and say 12 minus 4 is 8. All right? And some people struggled with that, which just kind of goes to show you that it's roughly during this age. You ask a 5-year-old to do this, they're going to have a hard time with it. Now, formal operational, 12 plus. This is the child thinks abstractly and hypothetically, which are kind of one and the same. You in this class as a high school student are in an if-then world. What I mean by if-then, most people think, well, that is not a hypothesis. Yeah, you're right, but your life's a hypothesis half the time. You always will say, if I don't call somebody, then they're going to be mad. You're always thinking hypothetically. You're always thinking one step ahead. And that's the big mark of formal operational. You're thinking one step ahead. Now, two things that often you know, also occur in the adolescent mind, formal operational mind is personal fable. This is David Elkin. And I'm sure some of the people are going to be able to relate to this. The belief that he or she is invincible. Nothing bad can happen. In fact, the adolescent's age bracket, this is where you know, adults get a little worried because these you know, kids at this age think that nothing ever is going to happen to them. They can you know, drive 90 miles an hour down you know, a road. You know, nothing is going to happen to them. Now, if you're asking, well, why do kids think like that? Part of the reason why is their age. They don't see a lot of people of their age, you know, passing away, you know, thank God. So they just have this idea that people live for a very long time, okay? Older people are more cautious because obviously of more experience, but also they have friends that may have health scares or have passed away. The other thing that Elkin talked about was imaginary audience, which some of you I'm sure can relate to. The belief that everybody's looking at you. All right, the belief that everyone is concerned with what you're doing. You get a spot on your shirt, every, you know, you think everybody in the class is going to point it out, which we know a lot of times is far from the truth. Now, <clears throat> common question here. Tim, 14 years old, believes that everyone is concerned with his looks as he is. All right? Now, what is Tim experiencing? Well, one, he's 14, so he's obviously in the formal operational stage. Now, what's that called? Personal fable, imaginary audience, Conservation, identity, confusion, or thought disorder. Well, kind of if you put the words, you know, the definition to one of these words, Tim believes there's an imaginary audience that's always watching everything he does. Okay? Now, the strengths and weaknesses of Piaget's stage theory. Okay, there were some strengths. One, he started to identify changes that occur cognitively. So obviously when we're born and when we grow up, our brain starts to understand things differently. That's good. Child's an active learner. In other words, the child's going to always pick up something that they see. Very rarely are they passive. They're going to play with the toy. They're going to try to take the toy apart. Most of the times, the kids, what, you know, a good example of that, most of the time, kids play with the toy other than how it's designed, right? Now, he basically was kind of the pioneer in starting childhood development research. The problem was there were some weaknesses. He believed in a stage theory. So, in other words, in the sensory motor stage, it is only when object permanence can occur. That's a problem because everybody develops differently. Some people are not going to develop object permanence until the preoperational time. So he scared a lot of parents by saying by age two they should be able to do this. By age seven they should be able to do this. Well, what if they didn't? Because again, go back to your nature, you know, development. Everybody natu naturally develops differently. Now, the other thing was Piaget really didn't culturally, you know explore that issue. He didn't look at other cultures, how other cultures can affect the way we develop. Probably one of the more complete, you know, cognitive developmental theories is the information processing model. And that simply says gradual changes that occur over our entire life. Not stage, you know, specific, not, you know, tied to a certain age. It just continuously is going to develop. Now, another factor of cognitive child development was led by Costi. And he stated Cultural and social interaction influence specific cultural cognitive development. He obviously looked at Piaget's weakness of not exploring the cultural aspect and kind of came up with his own. And he kind of came that a child can learn more at an earlier age than you know, Piaget said, which I also agree with. I think children are capable of doing things 
you know, or you know, a little bit quicker. A lot of times adults underestimate, you know, just because little kids are little, that they think in a limited way. Now, he came up with the term zone of proximal development, which is a key one here. And it's the number of tasks a child can complete with or without the aid of someone older. I'll give you a good example of zone of proximal development. A lot of times when a parent is present, the kid has an enormous amount of confidence that they can do something. Once the parent walks away, you often see the kid say, Mom, Dad, and Mom and Dad have to come back into the room. It's like they forgot how to do it, or they don't know what they're doing anymore. Because mom or dad offers support, they offer security. When security leaves, when they leave the zone, proximal means closeness. When they leave the zone, so to speak, when the kid you know, understands that that you know, adult is no longer there, they lose the confidence. Now, he also believed, led by Tosti is, I guess you could say, responsible for the fact that parents spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars of toys. Because he believed the more toys, the more stimulation, the more attention, the more proper nutrition, stable financial background, all can lead to a better cognitive development. And really what you know, Lev is you know, saying there is supporting the nurture side of the argument, that the environment plays a big role. Whereas, you know, I guess you could say Piaget was more on the natural side, right? What a child's given dictates when they go through those stages. Now, attachment's a big factor here, big factor, okay? Attachment is the strong emotional bond between caregiver and infant. Now, this is usually present within the first few years of life. Even you can go as far as to say the first moments of life. Now, attachment, what Harlow looked at is what factors lead to attachment. And what he found up with, with his famous study, he set up two cages, okay, that dealt with monkeys. In one, you know, cage, a surrogate mother was, you know, draped in like a soft, warm, terry cloth, okay? Basically, kind of, if you want to imagine this, right out of the dryer, all right, which we all know how that feels when we put it on. The other monkey was comprised of just simply wires and a feeding apparatus. Now, what Harlow was wondering was, is attachment, the emotional bond, based on, you know, touch or food nourishment? And he found out the answer, which I think most of you understood that. He found that monkey spent more time with the soft, warm, terry cloth surrogate monkey. This led to the idea of contact comfort. Contact comfort is that the touch of another is a sense of security. And I think most of you would agree with that. When you hold somebody's hand, you feel good. <clears throat> when you look at, you know, what a child, after the child is immediately born, they're given to the mother to be held. And when they're held, that gives them security. That filters in to attachment. Okay? Now, here's your typical question from the Harlow era. Harlow felt that infant monkeys, the need for contact comfort is less important than the reduction of the hunger drive. The need for social interaction is clearly overestimated. The need for contact comfort is more important than the reduction of the hunger drive. Infant monkeys raised in a rich, stimulating environment are more likely to be securely attached. There is a critical period during which imprinting must take place. Now, obviously it comes down to two things. What's more important to Harlow, being held or being fed? So if you said being held, contact comfort, then contact comfort is more important, and the answer is C. Now, Conrad Lorenz also looked at factors of attachment. He looked at, like, the timing, okay? So, Harlow looked at what factors contribute to it, okay? Conrad looked at when it has to occur, and what he found out is that there's a, a period called the critical period where certain things have to have happen. In other words, attachment has to occur right at birth. So in other words, what he said was, whoever, you know, the organism sees first is going to have a higher chance of being, you know, attached to. Now, when you look up there, he studied gossips, and he found that there was a critical period. Like when there's a common myth with this, that a golden retriever was present when these goslings were born, and since they saw the golden retrieval first and not the mother, go the mother goose, there they followed and they attached to the golden retriever. And there's a picture with the golden retriever walking and these little goslings following them. Now, again, critical period is attachment has to be has to occur right at birth. So to go with Harlow's theory, you have to hold the baby right after it's born for attachment to take place. Now, when we talk about language, you know, language has to occur before the age of 12. If language doesn't occur by 12, then that child's probably going to have some impediments that affect the way they speak or the way they communicate. Now, imprinting is kind of what I described earlier. 
It's the eliciting or causing of a behavior due to exposure of a certain stimulus. Lorenz's goslings formed an attachment to him, thinking him as their mother, during the critical period of attachment. Because he was present when they were born, whatever the goslings first saw, so that was, you know, what caused the behavior of attachment. Now, attachment in infants. Mary Ainsworth is another person in the attachment theory. And what she looked at was the strength of attachments. And she found either secure or insecure. Now, she came up with something called the strange situation experiment. Well known, by the way. And she was interested in the reaction of the child when the caregiver returned after being gone. Okay? This, to her, showed her the strength of what that attachment was that occurred right after birth. Now, secure attachment, the child cries when the mother would go to leave the room. And the infant, when the stranger came into the room, the infant was basically, you know, a little bit, you know, awestruck by it. And, but the child seeks comfort and shows excitement when the caregiver returns. Okay, so again, secure attachment, kid doesn't want to see mom leave. Stranger comes into the room, they get a little weary. Mom comes back after a period of being gone. Child's excited, drops what it's doing, runs to mom. That's secure attachment. Now, insecure attachment would have, again, obviously wouldn't be a, a very strong form of attachment, has two uh, methods here. Anxious avoidant attachment, child cries when mom leaves, all right? But child ignores, you know, mom when she comes back. So mom's gone after an hour, and the child, you know, uh, couldn't be bothered with it. Doesn't go to mom, doesn't run to mom, so that would show avoidant attachment. You know, obviously the child's avoiding mom. Anxious and ambivalent. Child happy when caregiver returns at first, but then pushes mom away after a moment. So this is the kid that runs to mom, grabs onto mom, and then pushes mom away. Ambivalent means they go back and forth, all right? Nothing is set. So again, you either have secure attachment, the kid's happier, you know, to see mom, or you have insecure attachment where either the child avoids mom, or the child can't make up its mind whether to hold mom or push mom away, which is again ambivalent. These can all kind of show, obviously, strengths and attachment. And, you know, professionals are kind of taught to look at that, especially the insecure, and question why does this occur? Is there something going on at home? Now, kind of a situation question here, see if we understand it. Tommy, a toddler sitting in a room with his mother, when a stranger enters, causes Tommy to cling tightly to his mother. His mother reassures Tommy that everything is all right and that he can play with the stranger. Now, obviously, Tommy went right to his mom here, okay, attached to his mom. So would you say is that secure or insecure? Now most of you, I think, would say That's, that sounds very good to me, that's secure, and you're exactly right. The answer was D, secure attachment. If, you know, obviously Tommy pushed mom away or started crying when mom tried to hold out to Tommy, then that's probably a sign of insecure attachment. Now, psychosocial development, break down the word psychosocial, it's the psychology of social development. Right, how we socially develop, which is obviously a big, you know, part of our lives. Now, Eric Erickson is the main man behind this. Okay, and Erickson simply looked at that we go through several stages in life. Now, that's important to understand. He thought that each in, at, in each stage, people encounter a crisis or a conflict or like a test or something that's got to happen. If it doesn't happen in that stage, it's going to lead to more social development or inferred social development. Now. Give you an example. Trust versus mistrust is his first stage. And the crisis is the child has to achieve trust. If he doesn't achieve trust in that stage, he will achieve mistrust, and obviously mistrust will affect the rest of his development, which I'll show you in a nice neat chart I've got. Now, Erickson, like Freud, and you know Freud from the unconscious, believed that early parental influence is on personality, but he also believed that environment can play a role in a person's development. You know, Erickson's theory is kind of one people like because, you know, at home, when the child's at home, parents are the key thing. When the child goes to school, then the school and the friends are going to be the key factors of development here. Now, <coughs> this is Erickson's stages, okay? And I'll go through a few of them. You know, I would suggest you kind of review all of them. But this is what I mean by that. When I said trust versus mistrust, which occurs in the first year of life, again, that ties in with attachment. All right, that's going in with common runs that it has to happen in the first couple days. You know, Harlow, Ainsworth all looked at trust versus mistrust. That's what Erickson called it. But that's the attachment stage. That's when it's occurring. But here's an example of what Erickson said. If the child doesn't achieve trust and achieves mistrust, it's going to affect all the rest of these stages. Like you look down here, 
intimacy versus isolation. Intimacy is a relationship with another person. Well, if they never develop trust, and they develop mistrust instead, then that's obviously going to affect the stage. Now, again, kind of highlighting. This is, when you look at the ages, you can kind of look at children how they develop. These are certain things that probably look back in your life that you remember doing. So the first, you know, year is all about attachment. All right, the child's pretty helpless, so they have to learn to trust people. Okay, if mom or dad are not there, in other words, they don't go to the child when they're crying, then the child develops mis mistrust. Autonomy versus shame and doubt. Child learns to control his own environment. This is, you know, one to two years of age. They start, you know, to do things on their own, like going to the bathroom. Okay, now. If they're not given that time by the parents to be by themselves, whether it's playing alone, whether it's going to the bathroom by themselves, they develop, they start to develop doubt about their abilities. They feel that mom and dad always have to be there for them to do something. They don't become autonomous. Autonomous means in control, all right, or self-sufficient. Now, three to five is the initiative versus guilt. Child's given more responsibility. Now, when you think about three to five, chores at that age are a big deal to a kid. You know, the kid looks forward to be given the responsibility that they're the ones that can take the plates off the table and bring them to mom. Okay? In other words, they are given responsibility that they are starting to develop initiative. Initiative means to try things. So in other words, when they're given a responsibility to do something, they develop initiative from it. They want to try other things, all right? Because they've been given, so to, so to speak, responsibility. If they're not ever allowed to do anything, or mom and dad do everything for them, and don't allow them to, you know, take out the trash or clean up their room, they start to develop guilt about their confidence, okay? Now, industry versus inferiority, this is kind of the school years. You look at six to puberty, this is we're talking elementary, we're talking middle school. Child wants to be productive and given the chance, willing to learn. If not, they'll feel inferior. This is where you kind of hear the quote, I want to do it, let me do it. I can do it. And they get mad when people try to help them because they want to be shown that they can be productive. This is a famous line from this category. Look at me, Mom. If they're basically saying, look what I can do without you, okay? Now, identity versus role confusion, that's where many of you are right now in the adolescent stage. You're trying to figure out who you are. And this is often done through experimentation. You see kids a lot of times changing, you know, their hairstyle or their clothing style or their friends, you know, trying to find out what works best for them. You know, it's kind of like they're going clothes shopping. They're buying many different outfits, trying them on, and they're going to keep the one that, you know, fits the best. Now, the intimacy, which I talked about, is really adulthood. This is when they start to form stable relationships with other people. Now, the rest of these deal with kind of our parent and our grandparent stage. Generativity versus stagnation is middle age, around 40, and attempt to give back to society. People start to get to a point in this stage where they're taken care of. And this is probably a good example of generativity versus stagnation generativity being generous, is they start to do charitable work. All right? you know, a lot of times see older people working you know, certain events or working voluntarily at the hospital because they feel in their life that they're, they're taken care of, now they want to take care of other people. Stagnation means stagnant, means you're not going anywhere. And you often hear people older like complain about that. They don't feel like they're doing anything. Now, the last one, integrity versus despair, is obviously dealing with older people. And the biggest issue they wrestle with is looking back in their life, reflecting, kind of like a senior does in high school. They look back and they kind of either get regret or they get pride. And that's exactly what's happening in this stage. Now, here's a good couple questions from here. Eagle drops out of her high school drama club and joins the rugby club instead of an effort to meet new people. Corey Erickson, Psychosocial Theory of Development, Kiko is currently experiencing what? Well, obviously she's changing what she wants to do, what she likes, what she dislikes. I would ask the question, she obviously is trying to figure out who she is. So in this particular example, which one is dealing with who she is, and most of you as you're scrolling down would, you know, would say that's her identity. And that's exactly right. She's confused at this time. She's trying a lot of different things. Now, another question from the Erickson, the first crisis. All right, so the first crisis is obviously the most important. Well, it's very important that they attach to their caregiver because their caregiver is going to eventually take care of them when they're helpless. So which one is the first stage? What's the, really, I like to look at what's the most important up there. Well, obviously, as you're scrolling through the answers, most of you are saying, well, I think trust is you know, what attachment is. And you're exactly right. So the answer is A. Nice job. Now, 
parenting styles, obviously parents have a big effect on the way kids develop. And parents, you know, treat their kids differently. Now, Diana Baldwin was, you know, someone that's known for her uh, research on parenting styles. And I'll come back to that, but looking at the three distinctive types. Authoritarian was one parenting style, and this is, you know, the barbarian, very strict. You know, because I said so, based on power, controlling what the kids do, being very harsh and disciplined. All right, they want to, you know, think for their child and act for the child. Permissive and different is, you know, permission, and permissive, they don't need permission. The kids don't need permission. They do whatever they want. The parents do not take an active role in the kid's life, are very passive, allow the kids to do whatever they want, stay out how late they want, you know, and uh, kind of develop things for themselves. Now, what's considered the most, you know, the best, or, you know, the best one is authoritative versus democratic. Authoritative parent is your all-around good parent. They're compromising, they work with the kid, and, you know, if they tell the kid they can't go out until 10, they say, well, tomorrow night you can stay out till 11. They're compassionate. They take an interest when the child is upset or when the child doesn't feel good. And they allow independence and the children have a voice. All right? They don't, you know, so to speak, keep the, you know, the kid very protected. Now, going back to Bulmer's research, she found authoritative parents produce the best, well-adjusted child. And, you know, it kind of makes sense. Now, Authoritarian and permissive often produce socially inept, and socially inept means they have problems in society. Now, I'll give you a couple examples of what socially inept is. Authoritarian, a lot of times, this is describing the kid who grows up in a very strict household. When they finally get do get freedom, they tend to go overboard a little. And the permissive kid, because they don't, you know, get that much per you know attention from their parents, they a lot of times will do things to get attention. All right, and sometimes this involves getting into trouble. Now, good question here. According to Baldwin, the type of parenting that would most likely produce a cooperative, caring, and empathetic child. In other words, ask yourself this. This is obviously a great kid. What's a great parenting style? And as you're kind of rolling through, well, obviously, one stands out. Now, some of you, I'll just help you with this one. Where you see authoritarian and authoritative, some people get those confused. Authoritarian is kind of the barbarian, the strict one. Authoritative, the T-I-B-E right here, just remember, is the most supportive. Okay, good, good way to remember. Now, and again, that's authoritative. Now, environmental influences on socialization. I mean, there's certain social skills, and you know, they are teaching this to kids in elementary. It's why it's so important how you play with other kids, because it determines later things in life that you're going to learn. Now, cooperation and ability to share with others. That's obviously a big thing. Make sure you share your toys. Let other people come over and, you know, play on the game. All right? Empathy is the ability to relate and understand others emotionally. So when a little kid does something bad to another kid, they're going to ask, well, how would you feel if someone, you know, threw glue in your hair? Now, self-regulation is the ability to understand how to control one's emotions and their consequences. This is where you kind of get the self-regulation, don't you cry. All right? I mean, they kind of tell you how to react to your emotions. All right? You shouldn't be laughing. All right? You shouldn't be crying. Now, gender roles... That's a big thing that's coming up, all right? The boy versus girl thing here. All right, gender roles deal with your behavior, attitudes and perceptions. A good way to remember this is a, like a person's role in a movie. They play, uh, you know, like someone who has the role of a tough guy is going to display tough characteristics. So a gender role is displaying certain, you know, types of behaviors, attitudes, thoughts that are tied to a gender. Now, gender roles develop two different ways here. Social learning theory is you learn the gender through, you know, watching movies. You see Rambo, you see Bridget Jones' Diary. You're learning the female and male role through simply media, all right? Whether that's videos, movies, you know, YouTube clips or whatever else. Gender schema. Remember, schema is an automatic thought process. So this deals with the mental. This is more dealing with the way you act. This is dealing more with the way you think. Now, gender schema is like automatic response. Some people, for example, you know, guys will feel funny being in the uh, women's department shopping for a woman because it doesn't feel comfortable. They get the thought that they shouldn't be there. And again, it's kind of, you know, an automatic thought. They feel off the bat just walking in there. They feel, you know, kind of out of place. Now, adolescence, okay, which we talked about with your identity versus role confusion. That was your Erickson stage, right? Well, you know, just to tie something else to this title, Make Connections. This is also the Piaget formal operational stage, okay, and that's, you know, the personal fable, 
in which is you feel you're invincible as well as the imaginary audience, you feel everyone's watching you. It's a good review here. Now, puberty is the physical aspects of adolescence. Now, those are physical changes as the body you know, prepares for reproduction. After puberty, uh, you know, the adolescent is capable of producing another child. Now, there's two things associated <coughs> with puberty. Primary sex characteristics, which are essential to reproductive organs. So these deal specifically with reproductive organs. All right, that's why they're primary. Secondary sex characteristics are kind of like I say, the bonuses of after puberty. This is, you know, the development of non-essential reproductive characteristics: body hair, body odor, okay, deep in voice, facial hair. You know, for a guy, those are things that are secondary. Now, Coburg looked at morality. Morality is the reasons why we come up with whether or not we are going to do something. Cheating is an action. The reasons why people cheat is your morality. Now, he asked children, <coughs> gave them a particular situation called the Heinz example. Should uh, a guy named Heinz, all right, ethical here, steal a drug that could save the life of his dying wife? And every kid asked, answered differently. Now, what he found was each child's answer was based on their particular cognitive level, how they thought at a particular time. Now, kids with higher cognitive skills <coughs> correlated or basically aided to better morality. All right? The criticism is Colbert didn't consider cultural or women's viewpoints, which obviously are going to play a big role on this. Now, Carol Gilligan developed a theory for women that believed that morality is about upholding social relationships. A lot of times you hear women talk about we, or us, or our. They base a relationship on the we happiness. Unfortunately, some guys base happiness on their happiness only. Now, Kohlberg had three different levels, which again, when you go back to this original point, these three levels were based on their cognitive types of thinking, where they were cognitive. In the pre-conventional level, it was simply the morality was based on avoiding punishment or gaining reward. Kind of remember it this way. Free wants to be free. So the reason why a kid doesn't, you know, let's say, you know, pull his sister's hair is because they don't want to be punished. They want to be free. Now, the conventional level is based on the approval of others and society's expectations or the way society wants them to act. Conventional is interesting. Go back with that same example. Why does a little boy not pull his sister's hair? It's because he doesn't want the disapproval of his dad. So in other words, this always deals with what other people are going to think. You know, I'll give you a better example, we'll go with one you guys can relate to. You know, pre-conventional, a student doesn't cheat on a test because they don't want to get in detention. They want to be free to do what they want after school. Conventional level, the reason why a kid doesn't cheat on a test is because he doesn't want the disapproval of his teacher or his fellow classmates. In other words, he doesn't want to be called a cheater. Right? It's always based on what other people are going to think. And, you know, again, if you're looking at society, expectations are that we don't cheat. Now, Post-conventional level is simply like a post-degree. If you have a post-degree, that means you're an expert. So post-conventional is an expert of morality. And this is based on higher moral personal expectations. So a kid's not going to cheat because he knows it's wrong, and he couldn't live with the fact that if he got a, you know, a grade that was inaccurate, how he could own up to it. So pre wants to be free. Conventional, you want to be, you know, a good way to remember it is consistent with what other people want you to do. Consistent means the same. In post-conventional is you're an expert in morality, like a PhD. Now, good question here, people. Baby is contemplating whether to cheat on his upcoming psychology exam, examination. He knows that he needs to get an A on the test. However, he also recognizes if he gets caught cheating, he'll have to accept any push, punishment he receives. Brody then decides that cheating on an exam outweighs the risk of getting caught. Now, According to Colbert, where's he at? Pre-conventional, operational, post-conventional, concrete, conventional. Now remember again, pre wants to be free. Conventional wants to be consistent with what other people say. Post-conventional is, you know, PhD, an expert in psychology. Now, if you said the answer E, Colbert's middle-level moral development, conventional, is centered around the desire to maintain law and order. In other words, he doesn't want to cheat because he simply doesn't want to be called a cheater. Okay? Doesn't want to get caught. Now, kind of the last part we're dealing with is adult development. Okay? And just kind of outline this. Most of you, I think, will probably see this with other people in your family, depending on the age they're at. 
Early adult years, 20 and 30s, physical changes, increase in physical abilities, muscle mass stays the same or increases. Good old 20s. Cognitive changes, they start to increase because you're in college. Social changes, you're starting to date, you're thinking about marriage, you know, creating a family, and so on. Middle adult years, 40s to 50s, physical changes, you know, start to, you know, decline in senses, not hear everything, not see everything. You might have to start wearing glasses. Cognitive changes, you know, you're still learning in your 40s, so that increases. Now, social changes, around the age 40, not that I can relate to this, you start to go through things. All right, midlife, you know, people have heard these midlife things. Now, midlife transition is people reevaluate where they are. This is kind of like halftime, all right, of a football game. They look at how they played the first half, now they say, well, I want to go out and play better the second half. Midlife crisis, Michael Levinson's term, nice guy. Understanding that halfway life is over and may experience anger and then try to regain youthful activities. Crisis is kind of the emotional aspect. This is kind of the way you act. This is your, you know, your emotions. You start to say, well, you know, I'm 40, you know, the best years are behind me. And so you try to relive this, okay? You try to simply, you know, you know, start to do things a little bit more that remind you of your older age. And this is also what Gail Shelley called mid middlesons, like adolescents. You might see a 40-year-old, you know, drive, you know, uh, you know, a red charger, okay, or something like a sporty car. Now, Late adult years, this is 60s and beyond, obviously the retirement age is now. Physical changes, obviously this is where you know, your senses really start to decline. Cognitive change is more to understand people. All right? Fluid intelligence, which is simply our ability to come up with answers, how quickly we can come up with answers, that starts to decline. All right? and that's why a lot of times when you're talking to older people, it takes them a little bit of time to explain something or come up with an answer. Now, when you look at crystallized intelligence, general over knowledge, that increases. Okay, that increases as you get older. Fluid intelligence decreases. All right, that's why a lot of times you don't see older people on Jeopardy. All right, because their ability to come up with an answer very quickly, you know, is simply uh, not there. But you know, crystalline is their overall knowledge. That's still, you know, they're still processing information. <coughs> now, good question. Students at Bayside High School are amazed by all the knowledge Dr. Jones possesses. Having taken psychology, you know that the professor's extensive knowledge can likely be attributed to, again, what type of intelligence deals with overall knowledge or accumulated knowledge. Now, most of you are looking at this, and right off the bat, you say, well, I think that's crystallized. Yeah, like a crystal, you know, develops over time. Crystalline intelligence gets bigger over time. Good job. Now, fluid intelligence, good question I like here, another way of asking. Blanks with age, while well, crystallized intelligence blanks with age. You know, this is you ever use these questions. So fluid intelligence, how quickly you come up with answers. Talking to someone older in life, a lot of times they can't come up with answers quickly, so most of you would say, well, that decreases. But I just remember you saying crystallized intelligence over time gets bigger, so that increases. So your answer right there would be, of course, the letter D. Now, two theories of aging, nature versus nurture. Programmed senescence, nature. Okay, the body is biologically programmed as when it will die. In other words, it's only set to live a certain amount of time. We don't like to think like that. Some support this through longevity gene. All right, some people in certain families live to be 80s, 90 years old. Where in terror theory, I kind of like this one, is nurture. Is when we're young, our bodies repair themselves a lot quicker. As we get older, ailments are less likely to, you know, you know, speed up. So usually when someone gets hurt in their 60s, that's a long time versus somebody in their 20s in terms of recovery. Now, last slide on here, death and dying, Elizabeth Cuba Ross basically said people go through five stages of not only death, but also grieving. And that is denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. A lot of times people deny the fact they have an illness. They get angry then that they have this illness. They try to make a deal with somebody that says, I'll live my life better if you give me you know, more time or you get rid of this illness. Depression is when the illness is not getting better. And then acceptance is the fact that the illness could probably you know, have a major effect. Now, good question. Which of the following correctly represents Elizabeth Cuba Ross's theory? Remember DAPA, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And that, of course, is described in letter D. Okay, thank you.